tell me about the father in the Bond case. Give me facts about um, Ross. What do we know about him? What um, evidence did the uh, probate and family court uh, he wasn't married to the mother. hear about Ross? Pa Patricia, you want to start? Um, yeah, he wasn't. Um, they met in Maine in '77. Um, he was a marine engineer, but he was working on a job, so he didn't have, currently have a job. Um, he got a terrible temper. Ross, they moved to Nantucket where she had a job. But he had the, they had the son, uh, Vaughn, but he had, he, he had some type of identity with, he obviously bonded with Vaughn. So he was the only one of the three children. Laura had two, step, two children that were uh, John's stepchildren. Um, and then he ended up, they ended up separating and, and he ended up getting custody. Okay, but can you just tell me a little bit more about Ross? He, was Ross's a ba he battered Laura. I'm oh, sorry. A, Go ahead. He, he, was a, he, he battered her. But she wasn't his wife, so his partner. And he did what it else about him. Ross's personality? He was a, a violent, raged. He didn't work. He ne knew he needed psychiatric help and did look into that. He was a loving father. What's that? I said he was a loving father. To Ross, I mean to Vaughn, not to the other two kids. That's good. Uh, the could I say the relationship was who's that loveless? The, what? Like they were, they slept in different rooms. I don't know if that's Ross or the relationship with, with the one with um, um, Leslie. Leslie. Took great interest in Vaughn's life. Oh, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Uh, how can you rephrase that, John? Um, not, I can't put it in one word, but not devoted to Leslie. Or not, um, doesn't have a good relationship. He wasn't intimate with her? Yeah, yeah, that's, okay, that's a better you. way to put it. And somebody said something else while you were rethinking that. Tim said something. Tim? I was talking about the relationship with Vaughn, how he's very involved, always went to the uh, sporting events, was meeting with the teachers. Um, seemed to really like the kid and show a lot of interest. Okay. Almost too excited at points the games, okay. they said. Okay. Judita, you had your hand up earlier, too. They said everything I was going to say. Okay. Anybody else? Should sure, I move to Leslie? We can come back and then we can think of anything else. All right. What about Leslie? What do we know about her? What did the court? You know, again, through the series of, there was a huge trial, right? Mm -hmm. There was 400 pages of transcript. Some describe her as like an instigator. And What's that? Some, like I would say an instigator, you know, they said a lot of the times that she was provoking him. She was a sexual deviant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <Wait. laughs> it didn't say that. It's just because she ran after him naked. <laughs> and there's, there's, uh, there's nude, you know, she would uh, go into his bedroom and, um, Run, run in nude and pretty much taunt, taunt him sexually to get sexual favors. But she abused him as well. Her both she taunted Ross, him. okay. Put it like that. All right. Is that right? She, she, she suffered from battered woman syndrome. We'll come back to what that is at some point. What else came out during the trial about Leslie and her life? Growing up, oh, she was my horse twice. She was abused as a kid, too. Uh, Janita, other relationships? Right, what, they went south. Failed yeah. relationships. Past abuse. What else? Uh, she made a lot of money. She was good, just successful at her job. Yeah. 
real estate broker, made over $100,000 a year. Estate. I'm sorry, what did you say? After real estate broker? She made over $100,000 a year. Yeah. Especially right. at a time, what is this, 1982? Oh my God. Right. Yeah. Yeah, she was too. And she was on Nantucket, so she was in a limited in a limited market. Yes. And she didn't really spend much time with Vaughn, like the father did. Up until five years old, um, she actually was a caretaker of Vaughn. So she was primary caretaker of Vaughn until he was five. And then we already said about uh, Ross being involved in all aspects of, of Vaughn's life. What can we say about Vaughn as well as her other two kids too? Impressionable. Okay. What else? Again, came they out during the trial. They were being picked on by Ross. They weren't treated the same as they Vaughn was treated. The other kids picked on, what else? Um, there was actually um, the the daughter actually was said that she was sexually abused by Ross. Okay. What else? Look to the facts of the trial, because again, that's what the appeals court and the SJC reviewed. That's all we know about the kids? Well, the kids, they had witnessed so much. They had witnessed so many dramatic fights and violence yes. in the home. I think they call Children them. Children witnessed. Spectators or. Witnessed the abuse. Okay. Can we go back over here and be more specific about the abuse? What evidence, again, did the court hear about specific instances of abuse? John. What? They had alcohol problems. Ross, oh, okay. Ross, he was going to Ross, be. Yeah, Ross, I'll put that under both, right? Yeah. And they both smoked marijuana. Drugs. Okay. Evidence of abuse was my question. So let's go back to that. Tim? Who testified? What the court here, now you, you said before, he was a batterer. Whoever said that first. He was, what I, evidence? He, he battered the wife though, not the kids. There's testimony from the kids and the wife. So we have it in, from testimony. What else, uh, other evidence? Oh, there was one trip to the hospital in the ambulance. That's the time she was knocked out. Yeah. Okay. What else? What other evidence of domestic abuse, of domestic violence? Um, do we have? Like 12 times yeah, what happened 12 times, Tim? The police showed police. up. Police! So we have a dozen incidents of at least police going out to the home. What else? Now, some of that dozen could be attributed to Leslie as well. Sometimes. Yep, yep, yes. yep, so we'll put that under both, all right. What other, what other evidence of domestic violence did the court, was presented in the form did of Did the kids either? speak and say that they? Expert too. Yeah, they were witnesses against it, so I think thought they spoke in court about uh, Dr. Jaffe kind of. Who's the Dr. Jaffe guy? That's your mother's, mother's expert. Mother's expert yeah. Yeah. But they didn't consider his his testimony, even though he had better credentials than there a Breezy. A Brosy or Breezy? We have Dr. Jaffe, then we have the GAL. Yeah. We'll come back to Dr. I'll say Dr. A. Yeah. So I've got how to spell his name. Um, that's not what I was thinking of, but good, we'll, we'll talk about the experts as well. What other evidence of domestic violence? Speaker. This, know, this is very basic, but he's 6'5 and she's 5'7. So. Okay. 
He, he, he just said he, he also yelled and lost his temper. Okay, of all those 12 times the police were called, or maybe the time that you know she gets taken away, but does anything happen as a result? Yeah, there's a 209A actually in effect at the time of trial. Anybody know what a 209 I, that, I didn't give you that particular statute. Some of you may be familiar with 209A. Anybody know what it is? Temporary restraining order. Uh, what is it? Temporary restraining order. Yeah, but what's 209A? Is that the emergency one? Domestic. Yeah, you're all sort of giving me bits and pieces of it, right? It's the abuse prevention statute in Massachusetts. Um, started originally for um, you know violence within the household, and it was typically you know a battered uh, spouse um, applying to the court for a, you know a civil prevention order um, from abuse has been extended over the years to dating relationships as well. Um, when um, we talk more about bullying at some point, the um, legislature also enacted a fairly new statute in the last couple of years, 258E, non-harassment statute where you know, any party with any relationship can also you know, get a harassment prevention order. What's but 258? 258? 258E, but 209A, again, has to do with violence within the household or again um, has been extended you know after this to dating relationships as well so um, there was a 209a order in effect meaning that um, the battered spouse cannot go near um, the um, I'm sorry the batterer cannot go near the battered spouse um, so that was in effect uh, let's go back to what the um, uh, experts had to say. So, what did mom's expert, Jaffe, testify about, Jadita? Um, she said that the mom had signs of a, of a woman suffering from battered women syndrome. Um, some of the signs were like learned helplessness, like she learns to stay. They end up staying in a situation where they're being abused because they feel as if like they deserve the abuse. She was abused as a child. Yeah, and, and she had past relationships. Yeah, so he, he said that children who witness or are brought up in okay, so an abusive did. home, then they tend to propagate that in their own personal lives. Okay. And so we're testify not only children. about um, the mom, the mom being abused, about battered women syndrome in general, but also about the effect of domestic abuse on children as well. But what? that would go for her too because she was abused as a child. Okay. Right. What did you say, Ashley? I was just going to say, and that pattern usually repeats with the right. children, and they become either a batterer or a battered, you know. Good. Okay. Now, who was A? Uh, Dr. A was a GAL. What's a guardian ad litem? Um, we'll be talking more about guardian ad litems also in the course. Who's representative? Of, yeah, somebody who's there to. Well, that's temporary. The wait, wait, everybody's talking at once. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah and then Ash. It's somebody that's appointed either by the court or sometimes uh, one of the parents' attorneys can get one, but their their interest is solely the, uh, the best interest of the kids. Okay, and what did you say, Ash? And I said they're given temporary custody of the child. No, that's not true. Um, what else did you want to say? Oh, okay. okay. Um, the, <laughs> no, the, the, no, you're thinking of a guardian oh, okay. as opposed to a guardian ad litem. Uh, guardian ad litems can be um, appointed for all kinds of reasons. Uh, typically, they may have an investigative uh, uh, job to do um, in the context of, for example, camp protection cases. Um, in addition to that court-appointed investigator that we talked about, the court might also appoint a guardian ad litem who is more of an expert in whatever the expertise is. For example, a guardian ad litem could be an attorney um, that is appointed to not only investigate the facts, but make a recommendation as to custody, as to visitation, as to termination, that sort of thing. In this, in this case, obviously, the guardian ad litem was a psych expert, a, um, a doctor, that the part, notice the parties agreed on. And that's typical in probate family court um, custody battles, where the parties will agree on um, a guardian ad litem 
who will investigate the case but also make recommendations as to custody and visitation and so forth and that person will write a report and also be available to testify in court and be cross-examined by the parties. Ash, you had a question? I was just going to say, aren't they um, required by the court to give um, uh, like updates and, and reports? To, like, like you said, recommendations. To yes, so it'll be. It, it's in the nature of a report that's filed with the court. Um, typically, is you know, for example, in probate and family court, you know, you can look up somebody's divorce. You can go to Cambridge, for example, and you know, look at my divorce and get the file. And but if there was a guardian ad litem appointed in that case, that 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 report wouldn't be in there. Um, typically, because it has to do with children, it's you know, um, what's the word? Um, What's the word? Not confiscated, and I'll think of it uh, by the court, blah, blah, blah. Parties are obviously they're, 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 um, available for the parties, for the attorneys you know, to read. And again, that person is also qualified as an expert and available to testify and be cross-examined. So um, you know, Dr. A, while Dr. A um, recommended you know, favorably to father, he wasn't father's expert with an ob objective. I've forgotten the dish. Did we yeah, get pe Okay, her. all right. Um, She's only missing one of them. So, what does Dr. A um, recommend, and, uh, Lester? He recommends that uh, Dr. Abruzzi, is that his right. name? Right. Um, He, he acknowledges the, the attachment of the child to the father. Okay, but what's his, yeah, so that's some of his findings, right? Yeah. That we just talked about. What does he recommend to the court? I don't remember. Father, Come on. father of physical custody. The father of physical, what else? The mother, mother has court. weekends. The mother has weekends, um, and what else? The she father has physical. to pay uh, custody. Um, yeah. Child support. Child support. Okay, but if yeah, father is physical, what else are we talking about? This case is different because it's probate family court, different from the care and protection cases we've been reading so far. Um, what typically the gets joint ordered? custody be continued? Joint legal. What does joint legal custody mean? Decision. Physical so, custody so means who they live. I said, what does joint legal custody mean? So both parties had joint legal custody. What do you think that means? They get to make decisions. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about joint legal custody, not only do they get to make decisions, but they have to be able to get together and cooperate and make decisions such as, you know, what religion the child should be, what school the child should go to, medical care, et cetera. Um, so that's an issue that we'll, well, we can talk about it now. Um, there's a domestic, exactly. She's is that what you're getting? Or, yeah, against uh, him, then he can't meet with her. And also, in terms of these dynamics that you all just talked about, is it possible that if you truly have a, a you know a battering relationship, a relationship like the, uh, you know what you described, um, is it possible for parties to to be able to have joint legal custody? Um, keep that in mind, all right? So he recommends joint legal and, and physical to, um, to, to Ross, okay? Um, anything else that, with the trial? So we'll, we'll talk about what the SJC ultimately held and the rationale and all of that. Did we leave anything out? Dr. I think we Dr. did. Can Bruzzi. we go back to Vaughn oh. for a moment? Uh, John? Yeah, there was <laughs> no, there was no, um, Findings of fact regarding uh, domestic violence. Yeah. In the decision. Okay. Yeah, and we'll talk about that with, with within the decision. Um, but is there anything else about Vaughn? Um, you mentioned before that the other kid, you know, other other kids were picked on. All the kids witnessed the abuse. Uh, parents' daughter brought out a, a question of whether she had been sexually assaulted at about one point by Ross. Um, anything else about Vaughn? 
and showers with his dad. Okay, showers with his dad. <laughs> and gives him back rubs. Back rubs. And he doesn't want to live with his dad. And what? He wants to live with his dad. He wants to live with dad. What else? Any any physical abuse? No. You sure? Yeah, this is. He didn't poke him and him. scold him. So there was Cuffed something him. about he he cuffed him. Cuffed him, poked him. Was that? Okay. <laughs> Don't care. Don't care. All right. Okay. All right. So, mom appeals, right? Yep. 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 And what's her argument? What does the SJC end up doing with this case? They pretty much say what we just said, which was they can't have shared legal custody when well, there's a restraining but, order and they can't communicate. Well, does the SJC say that, is that the holding of the no. court? Is that the rule? No. Because what does the court do procedurally with the case? So mom appealed, she went to the appeals court, the appeals court uh, um, uh, remanded, you know, with, with, and, remanded. and then the SJC takes the case after that. Yep. Um, and pretty much affirms what the appeals court does. But so, what happens procedurally with the case? It's remanded back to the probate court. For Why? Further, for further proceedings because um, they want more explicit fact findings and stuff like that. Um, why? The, you got it, but why? Awarding primary physical custody without making findings of facts on domestic right. violence issues. Okay, and and so what? When the case goes back down, what should the judge be doing? Staying consistent with that decision. Trying to find a, a better solution and then supporting, which is not joint custody, and then supporting that with um, really listening to the, I don't know if this was the case, they said you didn't need to listen to more testimony, but getting that expert testimony and supporting it in the findings of that. Just that, you know, significantly more detailed fact finding. Why? Why do you need all this fact finding? What is the To determine the best knowledge? interest of the child. Not just the judge's feeling of best interest. Yeah. Um, the court also said that it was a basic human right for them to live um, free of physical harm and fear, and especially in, in an environment where it's supposed to be a safe haven. And they wanted the court to give more um, weight to the, the effects of the domestic violence on the, the kids in the home and the mom. What else? Yeah. I wonder if they feel like there's something even more drastic needs to be done, like the parents, like, um, well, I don't know about the other kids, but for Juan, it, just, it seems like the, um, there's so many different things. I didn't even, I remarked on when I read the case, but I didn't even think about the, the fact that the father might be sexually abusing Juan. So I think they need to look at other, maybe they need to look at other options. The behavioral um, characteristics chart I gave you, which by the way, um, you already picked up on some of those characteristics earlier when I asked you about the, the case itself, as well as the power and control wheel. Is any of this familiar from other courses to people? Did, has anyone ever looked at this power and control wheel before? Do you know what it is, where it comes from? what the theories of domestic violence are. Do you not have one? I don't have one, yeah. Just the wheel? No, the, the behavioral characteristics. What's that? The behavioral characteristics of domestic violence. Grab one from over there, my bitch, because oh. I wrote all over my. Wow. 
last semester's writing project. <laughs> Yeah, who, who are, um, who are, who's the leading expert in the field dealing, uh, the field of domestic violence? Has anybody ever heard of Dr. Lenore Walker? Mm -hmm. She's the one that uh, advanced this whole cycle theory of domestic violence that starts with events sort of leading up to a particular abusive uh, incident, you know, such as, you know, the one where Ross you know, knocked her out and she had to go to the hospital, for example, that there may have been this, this sort of tension building stage before the battering incident itself. Um, and, then, and then obviously the explosive incident, the battering incident itself, and then after that, um, what she coined uh, the sort of the, the honeymoon stage, where there are um, uh, promises, I won't do it again, uh, here's some roses for you, um, and uh, you know, explanations, promises that are also you know, sort of uh, believed as well by the battered spouse and then the cycle begins all over again and over again, and it being, you know, again, a cycle, a circle. Um, also, that power and control wheel, you know, points out that, you know, obviously the words are power and control. Um, so some of the uh, behavioral characteristics that you guys picked up on will have to do with um, not only Ross's relationship with Leslie, but Ross's relationship with Vaughn um, being, um, totally involved <laughs> in all of the aspects of Vaughn's life, um, being, again, sort of um, maybe overly controlling. Um, be besides physical abuse, emotional abuse is sometimes a little bit more difficult to sort of, you know, pin down. Um, another expert that has a, diff a little bit different theory, and um, it's not this guy, Jeff, but he followed it, I think, and I don't remember his name. Uh, it's, more, it's more like, instead of a circle, it's more like sort of a straight line, that the batterer is sort of always in control, and it's totally a controlling situation. Um, the um, GAL report that I had authored on a previous you know, probate case that I gave you just as an example, um, the father was exactly like that. Um, it didn't sort of, you didn't see that circle, you just sort of s were aware of um, his control of situations sort of all the time. Um, he had, when he had the children, um, he had a um, sort of loose leaf book of, and, and he, um, he had the loose leaf book, and he also had, um, you know, like a whiteboard, a black, I don't know if it was blackboard or whiteboard in the, in the home, where he accounted for sort of every minute of their lives, what they would be doing. Um, and the loose leaf also had, you know, all of the court stuff, you know, every single, you know, he was just up on everything. So it was, a, again, a total, total um, control issue with the children. Now, getting back to this, so if the case goes back down, and of course we don't know, you know, how this case turned out. So on remand in the Vaughn case, what should the judge specifically be doing? That there's not gonna be a new trial, right? Just making a decision. Just making a decision. So what does that involve doing? Reviewing everything, reevaluating. Reevaluating and, and weighing what's this language in here that it says um, paying more um, attention to the significant facts. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so the, say the judge already has in his or her mind. I I am going with what I had before. You know, I I got whacked by the appeals court and the SJC, but. I want to give, again, joint legal custody. They should both have joint legal custody. He should have physical custody of Vaughn because he's the better parent, blah, 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 whatever. But now i got to back myself up. So what is it specifically 
that if the probate judge was going to do this, what specific findings do you think the judge should be making so again, he doesn't get taken upstairs, or she? John? Um, well, I would think one thing that the judge would do would be to, they talk about the gender bias study, yes. and maybe to yes. put those with the findings of fact to say, and this fits with num the number of something in the gender bias study that says this. So it looks like the, it looks like the findings of fact line up with that. Okay, so what, can you be more specific about what the judge could use? Because the gender bias study obviously objectively favored the Leslie, though, and you know, the, 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 the woman in the custody cases um, that the SJC, when it conducted this study, found that, that even though women tend to, and mothers, you know, tended to be the primary caretakers for children, they tended to lose more often than fathers when the probate courts heard custody cases. That, that was the primary focus of the gender bias study. Really? Um, yeah, really. <coughs> you wouldn't think so, right? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Was it because they could? And so, and it was at a time when you know, I, 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 we're very cognizant today about domestic violence, you know, issues. I'm giving it to you within the context of it. Obviously, we've been studying care and protection cases. So Department of Children and Families, when it recognizes there's domestic violence in the household, that's part of their service plans. I mean, to the extent that sometimes moms actually, you know, lose custody in a care and protection case, um, not because they're directly physically abusing their children, but because of the abuse in the, in the household and the children being maybe not physically abused, but emotionally abused as well, and um, mom suffering so much from PTSD, not being able to cope, you know, loses custody in, in neglect and abuse cases as well. Um, but that's today, I mean, back then, it was still, a, it was a fairly new um, theory, let's put it that way. In, in the law. Even when 209As first started, uh, women typically would be going to you know, district courts to get restraining orders um, and would meet opposition all across, not only you know, from the judges, from the clerks, uh, from the lawyers, from people in, um, there was a case out of, um, I think it was the Somerville District Court, it was Judge King. Um, I forgot what the woman's name was, but she went to get a restraining order, and not only did the judge not give her the order, but he, um, you know, reprimanded her in the court. You know, what are you doing? Blah blah blah, that sort of thing. And then she was killed uh, by her husband shortly thereafter. Um, so it was events like that that led to, you know, 209A, 20831, the gender bias study, et cetera. So anyway, we're back to the judge saying, I still want to give physical custody to Ross of Vaughn, in spite of, right, in spite of the, the 209A at the time of trial. Maybe by this time, 209As are only good for a year, so maybe it's, it's, it's um, uh, what do you call it, been dismissed since then. Um, but still, we had all this testimony about the abusive uh, you know, relationships. So how can you discount that or how can you acknowledge it and yet still, um, those of you that said best interest of the child, yeah, ultimately that's what it boils down to, right, Jadina? What about monthly visits or reviews to make sure that the father's not abusing the child because that's the only thing I can Well, again, this isn't a case where the department is involved. Is involved. So it was a, remember, dad, it actually started as a paternity case where, you know, and, and where dad was seeking custody of Vaughn. So it's just between mom and dad. So once this is over, you know, it's over pending, you know, modification later on. What do I want to write in my findings from the judge? Oh, should I reverse myself now and say, Ooh. No, well, I mean, I think, one way to, that I can think about doing it, but I don't know if this is the right way to do it, is to have them attend, make the custody conditional on attending a batterers, batterers program or something. 
that isn't exactly deciding what's in front of them. Yeah, court. anger management classes, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, but you still, the judge is faced with the SJC's mandate that if I'm going to order joint legal, if I'm going to order physical to the batterer, I've got to back it up with findings, you know, with clear findings that show that, you know, the, the, those custody orders are in the best interest of the child. The only thing I see that the dad has going for him is the fact that he's involved in his education and, you know, his extracurricular activities and things of those sorts. Oh, okay. I was going to just say, let me take my green marker and let's circle some of the positives, all right, for Ross. So Ash just said that I want him to live with him. Um, live with Dad. Okay. Tim said it. Tim said it? Tim said that. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> Give me another one because that would be one of it. That would loving be father. one of his, a judge's findings now on loving remand. Father. What? Loving father. Loving father involved in child's life. Oh, the fact that he had given up alcohol since 1985. Okay. And alcohol. He was, and he was going to his meetings. Okay. Meeting. He's okay. nurturing. What's that? He's nurturing. Yeah. Well, that goes with this. All right. He's involved in the child's schooling. Okay. Yeah. Is there any other violence? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Can you just it, say that it's mostly her? So the that she instigated it? If you remove her from the situation, why not? No, because no, but if you think about it, both of them. The positives, I don't that's know, it. they outweigh it, the it, negatives. He's been more like a friend and a companion. What do you mean by that? Uh, it doesn't seem like he's a strict father, you know. It seems like he's, he's his friend, you know, and he's... I think both of them both Is that... Um, in his favor, that would again support the judge, judge's decision for physical. It might. Well, it it might be much. considered a positive. How old is Vaughn? He was eleven. He was eleven. At the time of trial, yeah. right? He's mm -hmm. fourteen now. Yeah. And mm. what if I circle this? What does this say? Custody custody that, that mom really was only close with him in terms of the primary caretaker. So since he was five, He's up until dad. this age, um, well, raised years. by his father. Yeah. So th those are some, and probably the most important things that you can do. You just have to be very careful. Uh, not only the Vaughn case, the Jeff 20831 that also mandates. There's evidence of domestic abuse before you're going to award custody. And um, suppose it was also reversed, and it was, you know, his dad that was the successful real estate broker and all. That that would also be in his, you know, he could provide the better home financially, etc. Um, but that in and of itself is not going to be enough to overcome the, you know, the either abuse inflicted on the child or more particularly in most of these cases, the abuse the child has witnessed. Somebody just had their hand up. I was saying when you put in Dr. Abruzzi's or whatever yeah. comments mm -hmm. into it too, just that he recommended. And, and, and what you guys also didn't say was, you know, what did Abruzzi do during the course of his investigation and his looking at the family? Provided consultation. What's that? Provided consultation. It, what did that involve? A bruising? Yeah. He got involved when he was three because he was having problems at school. Or three years prior. Yeah. To a bruising got involved with Vaughn, you're Vaughn, saying. Directly, yes. Exactly, right. Yeah. So a bruising actually spent a lot of time with the family. Right. So you have a bruising's investigation in terms of the, not only the family dynamics, but the bond and the relationships, um, and then his recommendation as well. Yeah, so I definitely I would put that in my findings as well. If I was the judge, I'd be referring to the GAL's um, recommendations. But again, that wasn't enough because uh, the judge got taken upstairs on you know just relying on Abruzzi. 
So you have to be, you have to be able to acknowledge the, the domestic abuse and yet can that be overcome? In the end, would it still be better? Would it be in the child's best interest to be in the custody of um, the batterer? What do you think? The, the really tough situations. Uh, as I remarked before, just just awarding joint legal custody is a nightmare um, when when parties are um, um, involved in relationships like this. Lester, you had your hand up too. Just that I agree with whoever commented in this case that just a child being in the presence of the abuser is. If I, if I were in the judge's position, I would not award physical custody to the abuser. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. just doing that kind of sends the message to the child, this mm -hmm. is okay, this is acceptable conduct. Now the child that by that point in time, also 11 at the time of trial, 14 um, at the appeal, um, the, the child may himself or herself have begun to develop the behavioral characteristics of the better yeah. as well, um, especially where this child had the closer relationship with dad since he was five years old and older, Ash. The, the court did say though, both parents were, were not eligible to take the child. Well, that's interesting, because one thing I was gonna comment about, um, and you'll see in the behavioral characteristics chart, or if you do you know, any readings on domestic violence, Typically, the battered spouse, which is, you know, uh, most often a woman, I mean, it occurs in, in uh, gay relationships as well, um, and it occurs the other way around as well. The t battered spouse may be a man, but the battered spouse d does not come across well. Does not come across well in, in, um, in, in court, in, in mediations, in anything that's sort of, uh, you know, where that person has to act as if they've got their act together, because they don't. They're suffering from PTSD, they have low self-esteem, although you'll see that, you know, all, all three battered, uh, uh, batterers, battered spouses, and children all suffer from low self-esteem. Um, but the battered spouse, um, the one who's being controlled and being controlled maybe in all different ways, emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, um, you know, and the, the batterer not only looks better, you know, dresses, you know, wears the suit, whatever, is much not, again, there's that control again. The batterer is in control all the time. The battered spouse is not um, and may exhibit even physical symptoms as well. Um, so if you can imagine what that trial was like when Ross testified, it, it, they both testified, correct? Yeah. When Ross testified versus Leslie, you know, um, testifying. Um, in the GAL case that I gave you, again, the dad um, always appeared well-dressed, always appeared in control. Mom was always, always looked like she was crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Lester. That's exactly right. And s somewhere in that case, I don't remember where, one of the commentators observed, I think it might have been Dr. Abruzzi, that to an outside observer, right. the abuser looks good. Exactly. And that, that's, yeah. that's mm -hmm. terrifying, really. And the, you know, the, even though, uh, Jaffe, I believe they said, was sort of the younger psychologist, that sort of thing. Jaffe was more versed in uh, the dynamics of domestic violence. Abruzzi was more like a clinical psychologist in, in terms of, had worked with children, but not so much with you know, domestic situations. So you also have to get experts that really, really know this stuff. Um, it's tough. It's tough to recognize, especially if there isn't, you know, actual bruises and physical injuries. Yeah, but it's but yeah. Jeffy, the expert, you know, was that was a, you know, selected by the wife. So exactly. Exactly. Of course. And there's that piece of it as well. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I, ha I have a question about. Too. Doesn't the fact that 
Dr. A, um, she already, he or she, I don't, I don't remember if it was he, already had a relationship with the family. Doesn't that... No, but don't forget that the, the GAL was selected. By both. But uh, uh, I get yeah. that, but that, oh. the, the, that still doesn't form some kind of conflict of interest, the fact that they already had you know, like a prior relationship, and the, the doctor worked with Vaughn for years. It doesn't Before he became a GAL, is that the point you're yeah. trying to make? Yeah, but however, in a way, the party sort of waived any okay. argument they could okay. make because they agreed to have him, to have him okay. as a GAL. I think his um, testimony is the best because he's, he's witnessed, mm -hmm. you know, and he's an impartial you mm -hmm. know, expert. Mm -hmm. So all the judge can do, it, I mean, if you're going to go that route, is to take that piece of it, but you know, uh, um, incorporate it in your own in your own findings as well, um, that deal with again Ross and Vaughn's relationship. But it, it would be, it, you know, uh, it's really tough to do. Yeah. My other question is, um, when in determining the best interest of the child. Do they have to take into consideration what the child wants? Like, say, for example, Vaughn is saying, you know, I want to live with my dad. But what if he's saying it out of fear? Like, do they try to see where it's coming from? Or they just say, oh, he wants to live with his dad, so let's consider And, you know, that's one of the reasons sometimes for a GAL as well, you know, to really get at the best interests of the child according to the age. Now, notice that this is an older child as well. So the older the child is, the more the courts are going to look to the, the child's voice per okay. se. I want to live with dad at 14 is different than I want to live with dad at five. Okay. Um, and that's where you have, um, and we'll be talking more about role of counsel as we get to the child sexual abuse assignment. Um, Massachusetts is a client directed state. So if you represent a child as old as one day old, you have to substitute judgment. You have to figure out if you were that child and were mature enough to make the choice, what would the child want? That's different from best interest, where y y your, your determination is what would be best for the child. So you're almost imposing your sort of, you know, I'm the champion for that child. Da -da -da. I'm going to do what's best. Wouldn't it um, be the same? It's not. It's completely different. Again, what the child would want. Um, May not be it, in their best interest. Exactly. Um, the, um, I'm going to assign roles shortly for the child sexual abuse assignment. And in that case, um, the two older children, um, Alicia was, um, I think, about 11 when it started, and, and Jason was um, eight going on nine. But what, no, wait a minute. He, he might have been over 10, but we're going to play around with his age because of the, um, we'll get into that, the hearsay statute. If you're under 10, you can get some stuff in and care and protection cases. But in any event, that they, they directly uh, opposed the department and from day one um, stated they wanted to be with their dad. Um, and so their counsel um, acted in that way, even though there were serious sexual abuse allegations against the dad. Um, so the court then ap appointed a guardian ad litem that could also stand in for, you know, in spite of what they're saying that they want, this is what's best. Um, so, you know, a lot of conflict around these uh, role of counsel issues. Many states also have different versions. Some have hybrid versions of what I just talked about. Some have just GALs. Um, we're lucky in Massachusetts to the extent that um, uh, it, you know, the courts, the legislature, you know, recognizes that children should have counsel that would advance you know, what they want, that no matter how unpopular that voice may be, if the court never hears it, I mean, it's the judge, the court, that should make the determination from hearing from everybody. But the, if the court only heard about the child's best interest and not what the child is saying, then how can the court make a reasoned judgment from hearing from everyone? Um, so those are the, some of the issues involved with role of counsel that um, you'll see, you see in both domestic violence and child sexual abuse cases. By the way, both 
D I'm going to shorten it. Both DV and CSA are so interrelated. You many times see both going, both forms of violence going on in households, both domestic violence and and child sexual abuse, because again, it it goes to these issues of of power and control as well. Let's do this. Um, you don't have to look through the packet that I gave you. I want you to only look on the front because what we're going to be doing starting Thursday as we go through the cases that you have to read, which I, um, I've i given you for the next three classes, right? Thanks, I think. Do I get my syllabus? One, two. Yes. For the next, uh, this Thursday as well as Tuesday and Thursday of next week, um, a series of um, some U.S. cases and some mass cases on criminal child self sexual abuse, some mass cases on uh, care protection cases that were child sexual abuse, and I also gave you the um, the hearsay the. Um, the hearsay statute in Massachusetts that allows um, out-of-court statements of children under 10 regarding child sexual abuse to come in, in in criminal cases, in care and protection cases, and in civil, like for example, if this, if this probate case, if say the daughter was you know under 10 and there were and the court was going to hear, um, could could end up admitting her out-of-court statement rather than her testifying, blah blah blah. So I want you, we're going to be considering all of, all of that, all of those <laughs> different kinds of authorities um, and using this case study as the focus. So I'm going to assign roles. We're going to have um, uh, some people playing department attorneys, some district attorneys, because we're going to have the, the father is involved and was, this was a real case, but it's very old. I, I, by the way, um, obviously it's a very serious case and um, will be disturbing for you to read, but as students of juvenile law and ultimately practitioners, you might be involved in cases like this. Um, I've... Uh, um, I've redacted most of it, but still, you know, keep, keep it confidential as if you, you know, represented these people and even though I've given it out to you, um, please either destroy it afterwards or, you know, put in your files or something, all right? So um, Lee the dad, uh, this case ar arose when Lee was actually um, being arraigned in a criminal uh, sexual assault case regarding one of the neighbors. Um, and so, because there's a 51A that's reported to the department um, that, that that neighbor was also friends with Jason and there was sexual activity within the home, the department goes out to investigate and they end up taking the children from the home on an emergency basis. So what happens is the dad is involved at the same time in a criminal case and a care and protection case. So what we're going to do is we're going to, going to be um, involved in doing this mediation simulation where all of these uh, um, professionals have gotten together to see if they can achieve some sort of um, um, uh, solution to this case. So some of you will be DCF, DCF attorneys. I have a dist uh, the district attorneys. Um, there's also a court-appointed investigator, and th that reports in this packet. There'll be a guardian ad litem um, as well, and then attorneys for the children as well as the father. Now, as I said before, Alicia and Jason, who are the older children, um, are advocating uh, return to their father. So that would be your role if you represent either Alicia or Jason. Jonathan was not only uh, four years old when, when these allegations came up, there were never any allegations regarding Jonathan. 
but the court still uh, you know, named him in the care protection petition. So whoever represents Jonathan, um, again, you try, have to try to do the substituted just judgment rule because he was a baby. Anybody have preferences? I know you haven't read through the packet, but I'd like to assign the roles. Uh, Lester? I'm interested in representing Lee. Lee, okay. If no one else is. And I probably will uh, uh, give that role to more than one person because Lee's job is I was kind of wondering big. about that. Yeah. Anybody else want to represent Lee? <laughs> I, the hands went partly up and then down again. John? Yeah. Okay, so Lester and John. Okay. Uh, anybody else have particular? Pro Patricia had her hand up. Um, Cassandra. Oh. Patricia only Cassandra. Cassandra. Why? Well, the guardian now. Uh, I see them. Okay. Patricia. Cassandra, you raise your hand for GAL. Why don't you yeah. be court appointed investigator? Okay. Because that's similar. Okay. Okay. So Cassandra's the court appointed in uh, investigator. Patricia's the GAL. Lester and John are lead lease attorneys. Anybody else have a preference? Is this just for Thursday, or we're going to carry on? For the next three classes, that will be your role. Okay, Thursday I won't be able to be here, but you can assign me to any one of the ones for after that. Um, why don't I assign, you could be either a DCF attorney or a district attorney, because I'll, uh, there'll be more than one person on your team. So which one do you want? Either one. Okay, okay let, let me see if anybody has a preference. Did Dita have her hand up? Um, I don't have a preference, it doesn't matter. Who does? <laughs> you guys are so we haven't read it that <laughs> Usually people are fighting. Okay, I'll, be, I'll be a DCF. Okay, DCF, Dita. And then you had your hand pot way up, and then yeah. But <laughs> I'll do um, Jonathan's attorney. Jonathan's attorney, Nadej. Okay. I'll be Jason's attorney. Jason, uh, Ash. Be Alicia's attorney. Is that no, we Does that leave me DA? That, yep. Jeremiah, DA. And what I'm going to do is Joe and Richard are missing. Are the, the only two missing, right? One, two. Joe and Richard are missing. Yeah, because there's 11 of you. So I'm going to also give, um, let's see, uh, Jeremiah, why don't, uh, Joe will be your uh, okay. co-counsel. And then Jadida um, Richard is, my co -counsel. is your co-counsel. Co um, I'm going to email this out also so the on online class can see who the players are as well. So again, I'll just read it off to you guys for Thursday, but I'll, I'll email it as well. So DCF attorneys, we have Jadida and Richard, District Attorney Jeremiah and, and Joe. Um, Cassandra's the court appointed investigator, Patricia's the GAL, Tim is Alicia's attorney, Ash is Jason's, Nadej is Jonathan, Lee's is Lester, and John. Okay. So read through the packet. Um, as far ahead as you can, of course, you know, I mean the syllabus only has certain cases for, for Thursday. And um, if if at all you can get through. All of them, that would be great in the statute. If you can't, that's okay. Just keep going um, because this will be an ongoing discussion that we'll have for the next three classes. Um, DCF, um, Jadita, I may be looking at you first to, to give a, so try to get an idea, an overview of what happened and where so, sort of we are with the camera protection case. Um, so maybe we'll go through that first, just so everybody sort of understands where we are, where we're heading with the care and protection and how it impacts on the criminal case. Okay. It's a tough case to read. That's what I said earlier. That's my, yes, it's a tough case. Because I sort of jumped around. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of confused now with the cases and on the syllabus and this. So we're, we're well doing on the syllabus. You just have these criminal cases to read okay. for um, for Thursday. Um, are we going to discuss them or are we going to get right into our roles? You're going to get into your roles. 
using the cases and I'll be questioning you. I'll, I'll be acting as sort of the mediator and so I'll be questioning you. So the case of the about syllabus the case. is where we're getting our law to justify our e argument. E right. Exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, so that's why I'm saying and I know it's midweek and you have other courses and whatnot. But um, maybe over the weekend, if you could do all the reading for Tuesday and Thursday of next week so you can have an idea of, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but these cases are easy to read. They're horrible, they're horrible, but they're also easy to read. You know, the doctrines aren't that, you know, difficult to wrap your head around. Um, disturbing, yes, but um, so you can get the gist of the cases, the court's rule, the holding, you know, the rationale to use in your role. Okay, John. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You want to do criminal or child welfare? Whatever. Whatever. I'll contribute in any way. <laughs> that I can. Do you, do you have, have a preference? preference? Yes, yeah, you want to do that? Oh, thank you. I would do the criminal case. Okay. All right. That's a good idea to be up here. You sure? Yeah, oh yeah, that's okay. fine. So I'll do the care and protection. Yeah. Okay.